<laughs> All right. Let me get into this real quick. So, uh, happy Mother's Day. I'm really glad we did this Mother's Day thing now because I had nothing for Mother's Day. So, that's good that we got that. <laughs> I was kind of wondering if I could like tie some other themes in here, but it just didn't work out. So today we're going to be going over a few verses, Matthew 17, 24 through 27. And so if you have your Bibles, that's kind of where we'll be following along. And I'll be kind of going a bunch of other places, but pretty much that's where we're going to stick around. So I'll just start off and I'll read it and then we'll start going through it. So, 17, verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? And he said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From who do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go out to the sea, cast a hook, take the, uh, and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So just first off, it says uh, in, in that verse 24 there that uh, they were coming to Capernaum. Capernaum was... Jesus' hometown, not, not his original hometown, but the town where he lived during his ministry. And also, um, right there, we see that they talk about this two drachma coin. So I, I looked up this two drachma coin. I think I have an image of it. Yeah. So this is actually a shekel. I couldn't find a two drachma coin. This is a shekel. It's equal to a two drachma coin. This is kind of around the time of Christ, like what their coins would have looked like. I thought that was kind of cool. And so... This guy, uh, this tax collector apparently comes up to Peter and he says, does your teacher not pay the taxes? And the scripture doesn't really tell us what the tax collector's motive was in this. I don't know if he was asking, you know, maybe he was just like, hey man, it's, it's April 14th. <laughs> <laughs> does he pay taxes? You know, uh, I don't know. But it kind of seems like the fact that he didn't actually just go to Jesus, he was like kind of circumventing him kind of like he was trying to get some dirt on Jesus, right? And we know that was pretty common during the ministry of Jesus. People were always trying. He was under the microscope all the time. People were always trying to accuse him or defame him. And then we see in uh, this next scripture, Matthew 12. It says, uh, Matthew 12, 9, it says, He went on from there. This is another story. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? so that they might accuse him. And he said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out to conspire against them on how to destroy him. This is just one story of many. We see, obviously, uh, I mean, even the story before this, uh, in the very chapter, it was Pharisees conspiring against him. We see before his death and resurrection, uh, all the way up to his death, people were accusing him of whatever they could. He, like I said, he was under the, the microscope. People wanted to find dirt on, on Jesus, and they just couldn't find it. Just like Jesus, if we live like Christ, we too will experience those kinds of Things where people are looking to defame us, people are looking at us, trying to um, trying to find ways to accuse us. We know, you know, even Satan, he's the accuser of the brothers. He's looking for ways to accuse us. In Matthew ten or Matthew five, verse ten says, "Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who are before you. So it, it shouldn't, 
you know, when we're persecuted, when people come against us for the name of Christ, it shouldn't be looked at as necessarily a bad thing. If anything, it should be an encouragement that we're, maybe we're saying the exact thing we should be saying or doing what we should be doing. We move on to verse 25 and 26. And it says, so, so after the guy asked, does your teacher not pay the taxes? Peter said, yes. I don't know if he actually knew the answer to that or if he was just answering. Um, but he said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him, first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when Peter said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. So Jesus often, throughout the scripture, uses metaphor and parables to teach us earthly lessons. You know, he uses it um, in all through even the, all the gospels you see, the parables where it you know, starts off with the kingdom of heaven is like, right? The kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is like. And uh, the reason is because the, the things of, of heaven are just too much for us to understand. We just don't have point of reference. So these parables help us to, to have an earthly example of what these heavenly things mean. And uh, you see right here when he says the sons are free, he's using the kings of the earth and the sons of those kings as an example of a higher truth, a spiritual truth. And, and we see the same, a similar kind of thing in one of the parables Jesus spoke in uh, Matthew 7, verse 9. He said, Of which one of you, if he has a son, or if, if, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask him? So, we have Jesus... In both of these, we have him, you know, portraying the relationship of a father to son, a king to his son. Of, 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 and, and he's showing God's relationship with his children. Another thing that he's implying here is that the earth belongs to the Lord. And by extension, his sons are free. In Psalm 24, 1, we know this, this verse is pretty common. It's, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the holy hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his place? Um, you now, I was, I was writing this, and I was thinking, you know, I know that's true. I know that scripture. I've heard it a million times. The earth is the Lord, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to him. I know that's true, but, you know, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. And, you know, we, we walk through this world filled with squatters. People who don't really belong here. <laughs> and, and we're kind of the strangers. I, you know, I was thinking about, like, the, the children of Israel. I don't want to take this any weird place, but just bear with me. Like, the, the children of Israel walking through the wilderness, and, you know, they're just kind of, they're, they're, you know, they know that there's this land promised to them, but right now they're just sojourners traveling. And that's kind of what life is like here on earth for Christians. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a spiritual power, a prince of darkness that, that runs this world right now. And it's not going to be like that for very long. His time is coming short. But meanwhile, we're walking through that. You know, we're, you know, spiritually speaking, we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And so it's good to remember that even though it feels like we're strangers here, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He picks up in verse 27. So after he says the sons are free, um, then he goes on, however, not to give offense to them. We'll stop there. However, not to give offense to them. So, so he's, he's saying the sons are free, but then he qualifies that by saying, however, which means whatever I just said, I'm going to say the opposite now. However, not to give offense to them, and he's going to say, go pay the tax. Now, I, I looked up this word offense, because, you know, we use that word a lot. A lot of times it's like, oh, that person offended me. And what we mean is like, that person hurt my feelings. 
Um, but that, that's not exactly what the word means. It's this word, scandalizo. Guess what that means? Yeah, scandalize. Okay, you got it. It means to scandalize, to cause one to stumble or sin, to offend. And so it's, you know, I think it's less of hurting someone's feelings and more of actually causing someone to stumble, so causing someone uh, to do something that they wouldn't have otherwise done. Offending or causing someone to stumble is way against the Lord. You know, we hear the Lord talk about if, you know, the little ones, I think he's talking about children. He's, if anyone causes these little ones to stumble, it would be better to have a millstone tied, as, or tied around his neck and thrown into the sea. Like that, that's how serious God feels about causing others to stumble. And so, you know, it's not just a, a small thing when we say, um, you know, we shouldn't cause, some, you know, cause someone to stumble or shouldn't offend somebody. It's actually a pretty big thing. Apostle Paul talks a lot about causing people to stumble when he talks in, uh, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 14, when he talks about if he says, you know, if, if eating meat causes my brother to, to stumble, I'm not going to eat meat. He said, if drinking wine offends my brother, I'm not going to drink wine. You know, I'm sure there's some people here, a lot of people here probably fine with drinking wine or beer or whatever. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. But then there's others, just remember, there's others who aren't okay with that. And so we got to be careful with those kinds of things because we can be offending people not even realizing it. I had a, it's probably 10 or 15 years ago, I can't remember. I, I think I was in my later teens. And I, I was, I, there was this word, you know how there's certain words that they're like borderline, like some people think they're bad and other people don't really care. And so I had this word that I didn't think was too bad. And so I was using it just in, in my, uh, just like in a casual conversation. And I ended up finding out that there was a kid who was a little bit younger than me who looked up to me, who heard me say it and was offended. And, uh, and so I ended, up having to, uh, I ended up having to go to him. And I apologized. I felt so horrible about that. I was like, man, you know, like, I, I know what that's like. I, I've, I've heard older Christians use cuss words before when I was a kid. And it kind of, it kind of bothered me when I was a kid. And so I was like, I got to go to this kid. I got to tell him sorry. So I apologized and told him I'm not going to use that word anymore. It, it didn't seem like a bad word to me, but it was to him. And I'm like, if it's going to offend people, you know, I, I don't want to offend people. And so if, if a word's going to offend people, then I'm not going to use the F word anymore, you know? <laughs> okay, it wasn't that one. I was just seeing if you were paying attention. I know you're dying to know which one it was. I'm not going to tell you. I don't want, I don't want to scandalize you. <laughs> but we got we to gotta be careful who we offend, who we, who we say things to. We, we never know who's going to be listening. And then he says, go to the sea and cast a hook. Let me, let me read the book. Go to the sea, cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. I love how God chooses to do things. Because I can imagine a million other ways I would have gone about trying to get a shekel. Now, just so you know, a shekel, like I, I was actually thinking it was like a quarter or something. I didn't know. I, a shekel is like four days wage. And so I, you know, I kind of did the, uh, the median wage in America and multiplied that by four days. And it was like about a thousand dollars, you know, so it, it wasn't like you know, a coin. I mean, it was a coin, but it wasn't like a coin as we think of it. It was quite a bit of money. But it was, it was still, you know, something that uh, they had to pay. They didn't have. And they needed to get it right away. I would have never done this. What Jesus did is just tell Peter, go catch some random fish. And there will be a coin in there for you. Don't worry. It will be in there. One thing I, I noticed while reading that, I've heard this scripture a million times, but I never really thought about it, is when Peter cast his hook, it wasn't his, he, he was a professional fisherman at one point. It wasn't his fishing skills, though, that, that caught the perfect fish with the coin in its mouth. No fisherman is that good. But it was, it was God who did the work. God told Peter to simply, he said, go to the sea. And cast a hook. Those were, his, those were his demands, his commands, I should say. 
Those were the commands put on him, and he did it. But God was the one who, I don't know, I, I, I wish I knew the story of how that coin got in the fish mouth in the first place, like the journey that coin went on. Um, the Bible doesn't say. Maybe the sequel will tie up some loose ends. I don't know. I'd like to know, though. <laughs> but we don't know what happened. But, but, but God made that coin go in the fish's mouth. He made that fish go right where Peter was. I mean, Peter could have gone anywhere in the Sea of Galilee, which was like, I, I don't know how big it was. It was huge. You can't see across it. Could have, Peter could have gone anywhere. He gone, went to the right place, and God provided the fish. Kind of reminds me of the scripture where, where um, I, think it was, I think it was Apostle Paul who said, one, uh, one plants and other waters, but God gives the growth. You know, somebody dropped their coin in the water. <laughs> Peter cast the hook, but God gave the growth, you know. It's the same thing, I think, when we go out and preach the gospel. You know, we're going out and casting a hook. We don't know, we don't know who's gonna, who we're going to catch, but God knows. He's the one who leads them to us. We just have to be diligent to go out with our hook. The hook being the gospel, of course. There are other times that Jesus gave super specific instructions about what to do. So I, I included these scriptures just because I thought they were cool. The first one, uh, Luke 19. Uh, 30, and it says, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, or <laughs> those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, hey, why are you untying that colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. I just love it. I, I, I love the, the thought of it. I, I wish I were the, the guys who got to do this. Because how cool would that be? You hear this whole thing, and he's like, this is how it's going to go down. You're going to say this, and they're going to be like, well, hold on. And then you're going to be like, oh, it's all right. The Lord needs it. You know, the, the whole thing is mapped out ahead of time, and then they go do it. And it happens just as they say. The other one was a few days later, so that would have been on, on Palm Sunday, right? Like the day of the triumphal entry, that was the start of Passion Week, as what we know as Passion Week. And so then a few days later is when I think uh, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, um, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And they said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered a city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says of you, where is, your, where is the guest room where I meet the Passover with the disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. So those are very similar scriptures. The only reason I pointed them out is because it's so cool. And I, I want that in my life. I don't know about you. I want to have those experiences in my life. I believe that the Holy Spirit is fully capable of using us in those ways. I've, I've experienced it on small scale, nothing like this, in my own life where the Lord prompts me to do something and I do it. I, I'm just obedient. I, I don't really know what's going on, but it turns out. I, I think if we want that, and I think we should want that, because, I mean, what better place is there than to go where God tells you to go? But if we, if we want that, I think if we could have the, the, the attitude of Isaiah when, when God said, who are we going to send? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. If we have that attitude, we say, Lord, I want to be sent. I want you to send me somewhere. I don't even know where. Just send me. I want to do something for your kingdom. God will send us. Where was I? Another thing um, that I thought about when I was reading this scripture and just bear with me, because this is going to sound weird at first, but it, it, it'll get good. Um, There's the money issue. So, for a long time, I thought I was like pretty, I had a pretty good grasp on how to handle money. You know, like I've always heard save, 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 you hear budget, you hear, you know, be careful, you know, lending money, all those different, you know, logical things. 
And, uh, but a, a, a while ago, this was a few years ago, I started reading the Gospels, and I started noticing like all these things that I had heard over the years, this good advice, and then I'd see Jesus and his ministry and, and how he handled the money. And I, I'm not saying Jesus is irresponsible. Understand, when I, see, when I see the way Jesus does things, I don't assume Jesus is being irresponsible. I assume that I don't understand, right? Jesus is the one who's right. I'm the one who's wrong. That's the attitude we should have. But I, 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 I saw these scriptures. And so, the, you know, this one the, kind of struck it, struck it off, where it's kind of like, so here, here's Jesus. I assume he would have known that there was a tax. Maybe he didn't. If he knew there was a tax, you know, he hadn't saved for that tax. If he didn't know there was a tax, you know, they say you should, the, the professionals, the money advisors say you should always have a very a minimum of $1,000 for, for emergencies, right? He didn't have that. He didn't heed that earthly advice that I've been taught. How did that work out for him, though? Worked out just fine. He had everything he needed, didn't he? And so I have a few other scriptures here. I, I didn't put them up on the board because I, they're pretty common scriptures. We know, we know them. Um, but I was thinking about Judas. Um, in John 12, uh, we, we learned that Judas, um, he was, you know, Judas Iscariot, the guy who betrayed Jesus. He was a thief. He would steal. He was in charge of the money bags, apparently, for all, all 12 of them, I assume. He was in charge of the money bags, and he would just help himself to whatever he wanted. You know, when I read that, I think, hmm, you know, God, he knows, the, he knows the, every man's heart. Why would he put Judas in charge of the money bags? See, my, my earthly understanding thinks that's foolish. But how did that work out for Jesus? Just fine. I'm getting to a point, trust me. There's a story, uh, so that same story, and this is in John 12, 1. So this is the same story where we learn about Judas taking from the money bags. And it's about this woman, I think it was Martha, um, who, was, who had a jar of very expensive ointment. And, and it, was an, um, it was nard. They say like a, it, was th- it was worth 300 denarius. So like 300 days wage. That's like a year's worth of money, right? So think about how much a year of money would buy. It was a lot. And, you know, my natural thinking would be the same as Judas. So so in this scenario, Judas, he sees what, what's happening to this oil, this perfume, and he's like, no, no, no. He's like, we should be giving this, you know, to the, we should be selling this and giving the money to the poor. And obviously he had nefarious plans in his mind, but, you know, I, I think I would be thinking some, somewhat similar to him. Like, why are we wasting all this, you know, expensive perfume? Why don't we sell it and then use the money for something good? But Jesus said, the poor are always going to be among you, but you won't always have me. I kind of think Jesus was thinking, what's more important than anointing me for burial? Yeah. Yeah, we could use it on something else, but what's more important than this? This is very important. So once again, my my logic of how to spend money, how, how to view finances, is not the same as how Christ did things. I'm not saying Christ is irresponsible. I'm saying... I need to refocus my mind to understand the mind of Christ, to, to understand these situations. He, he, he understood the spiritual realm. He understood things that we don't. We, we think in the physical realm. Christ knows the eternal, um, you know, the, the eternal things, things that really matter. Another story was the, the rich young man, the rich young, young ruler, and he came to Jesus. He was looking to be justified. He's like, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, oh, you must, you know, do all these things. He's like, oh, I've done all those, kept all the commandments, I'm good. And Jesus said, one thing you lack, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. Once again, this is not financial advice that I would ever give someone. If someone like that asked me, for, I'd be like, you know, why don't you like diversify, you know, like (laughs) some high risk, some low risk, you know, get your portfolio, you know, what." No, Jesus says, sell it all, get rid of it all. And it's like, well, then he has nothing. And that's exactly right. He has nothing, but he would have the protection of God. 
So, so once again, I just want to clarify. I am not saying we should be unwise with our money. I'm not saying we should blow out our credit cards and just trust that Jesus will pay it. I'm not saying to ignore the future and just pray that everything will work out. There's plenty of scriptures that tell us the importance of, of saving or, or, you know, the, and even budgeting or planning our money is super important. But here's the thing. We can plan to do things, everything that the professionals tell us to do. We can plan and save and do everything the right, the quote-unquote right way and still end up flat broke. We are supposed to be good stewards of God, the money that God gave us. That's for sure. I'm not disagreeing with that. But the most important thing is that we would trust in the Lord with our finances and lean not on our own understanding. So I, this balance between you know, how much do we trust God and how much do we... I, I don't have that down pat, honestly. And I don't think any of us do. I think it's something that I'll be learning my entire life. Because in the flesh, I want to control things and I want to make sure that I do everything possible to have a prosperous life. But there's a spiritual side of this thing too that doesn't always make the same sense that I do. And so that's what I'm trying to say is we need to be open to what the Lord's calling us to do at any moment. So in summary, Luke, you guys can come up. Um, so when I was putting this together, I, I thought of an old saying, uh, I'd rather be lucky than good. You ever hear that? <laughs> now, I wouldn't say that, per se. I actually changed it for what we're talking about to, I'd rather have providence than toil. And uh, so providence is trusting that God will care for us and that he will provide all our needs. That's what providence is. Toil is more than just hard work. Toil is hard work, but it's much more than that. Hard work is not bad, but hard work plus uh, toil is exhausting. It's a struggle. It's a battle. It's laborious. <laughs> it's not good. So my question, given in, in light of what we just read, which would you rather have? Would you rather have, um, would you rather have providence or toil? Which one do you want? You know, I, I get the, uh, I don't get the idea that Christ was worried too much about his next meal. He wasn't worried about where he was going to sleep at night. And in fact, at one point, Jesus even said foxes have dens and, you know, something. And, uh, you know, the thing. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. I didn't write that one down, so that's what I get. He wasn't worried about that. He wasn't worried about where he's going to if he was going to have the, the tax money for Uncle Caesar. And Jesus, Jesus trusted in his Father, and so should we. So let me pray, and then we'll wrap up here with a song. Lord Jesus, thank you so much, Lord, that, um, Lord Jesus, that you cover, <laughs> that you cover us. Lord, we, there are so many times, Lord, where, where we think we know what's going on, Lord. But your wisdom is so much higher than us. Your knowledge is so much greater than ours. And I'm so grateful for your providence in our lives, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would work on our hearts, Lord Jesus, that you would make us diligent men and women who, who obey you and who honor you. And Lord Jesus, that, that we would know that we can trust in your provision all our days, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' name. Amen.